Good evening, everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are really, really excited to have Alice Randall here tonight with Francesca T. Royster for a discussion of My Black Country, a journey through country music's black past, present, and future. Uh, we were already very excited about this book, and then this conversation just happened to be even more in the zeitgeist uh, because of one one very famous uh, Beyonce, which has helped um, bring bring what you know has been an important conversation, particularly for those of us who live in the South for a long time. Um, it's sort of you know gotten very uh, mainstream in a lot of places all of a sudden. So I feel really grateful um, that this this conversation is something that a lot of folks want to engage in so if you are coming to Keras for the first time or if you're coming because you love beyonce we're glad you're here um we tonight's event is co-sponsored by the auburn avenue research library on african-american culture and history it is also co-sponsored by the department of creative arts at agnes scott college and tracy laird is an amazing country music scholar um, who teaches in that department. So I know Tracy's gonna be here tonight with some of her students. So thank you for being here. Um, we have loved Alice Randall's work for a long time. Um, she is a New York Times bestselling novelist, award-winning songwriter and educator. She's widely recognized as one of the most significant voices in modern black fiction and has emerged as an innovative food activist committed to reforms that support healthy bodies and healthy communities. She lives in Nashville, where she writes country songs. Um, she is the author of My Black Country. She is also the first black woman to co-write a number one country hit, Trisha Yearwood's X's and O's, which is a song that was the soundtrack to, to many of my uh, younger days. Um, definitely two step to that song. So, um, but I did not know that you wrote it until I was much older. So I'm, I'm reading your book. Um, I was grateful for the contextualization that that provided. And I learned so much. I've also learned so much from F Francesca T. Royster, who is a professor of English at DePaul University in Chicago. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, in English in 1995. At DePaul, she teaches courses on African-American literature, queer writers of color, and writing about music. She's written scholarly work on Shakespeare, Black lesbian country music fans, Prince, and Fela Cutie on Broadway, among other topics. Her recent special issue of the Journal of Popular Music Studies on the Futures of Country Music, Uncharted Country, co-edited with Nadine Hubbs, won the 2021 Ruth Soley Award from the American Musicological, Musicological so Society. Her books include Becoming Cleopatra, The Shifting Image of an Icon, Sounding Like a No-No, Queer Sounds and Eccentric Acts in the Post-Soul Era, Black Country Music, Listening for Revolutions, and Choosing Family, A Memoir of Queer Motherhood and Black Resistance. Her book, Black Country Music, which we also celebrated at Karis, was recently awarded the 2023 Ralph Gleason Award for Music Books by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And you can go back in our YouTube and watch the conversations that we had about Black Country Music, as well as Choosing Family, a Memoir of Queer Motherhood and Resistance. So um, check those out. Welcome to everybody watching uh, at home. We'd love for you to shout out where you're watching from. I know some of you already have. You can ask questions at any time in the chat, um, and we will incorporate them into the conversation. But welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to get out of the way so that we can get right into this. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, thank you so much um, to ER and to Tracy and everyone at um, Karis Books. It's so lovely to have this occasion to talk to you, Alice. Um, I'm such a big fan. Um, I was a big fan anyway. And now, um, yeah, I have so many copies of your book around. I have this one that they gave me. I have one up there. I keep giving them as gifts. Um, I'm so excited um, for your stories and for your beautiful, gorgeous album. So I hope we get a chance to talk both about the book and the album. But um, yeah, so thank you. And thank you for um, allowing this conversation to happen <laughs> with us together. Um, I'm thrilled because as you know, I, some people might know, I blurbed Francesca's book. I loved reading it in early galley form and uh, I, I am 
thrilled to be entering into this space with you today and into library shelves with you. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so Alice, let's just start with like, talking about right now. Like this is um, such an amazing moment, um, powerful, historic, hopefully long lasting. Um, and I just wanted um, to know, like, how do you, how are you wrapping your head around um, these public conversations about um, Black contributions, co-creation of um, country music and, you know, given that you've been working in this area as a songwriter, as well as um, a teacher scholar and as a novelist, like all of these intersections have been with you for such a long time. Um, but what do you what do you think we should make of this moment or what are you making of this moment right now? Well, I think of it in with two simple words, and one is that it is good news at long last. It is a Juneteenth moment. Mm -hmm. Good news that the history of Black country is being recognized, and that is also a sort of Sankofa moment to look back, to move forward. But I also particularly think that intimately, and thinking about my Black country, I've been working in country music for 41 years. I came here. At, in 1983. So I've been in working as a black woman. I've been the unexpected body in the room in Nashville and country music on Music Row for 41 years. But when I arrived in 83, I met Charlie Pride shortly after that. And he had been at the top of the charts 29 times. He had been in the number one space 29 times when I arrived in 83 as a 23 year old. It isn't until this year, and I'll be 65 on May 4th, I'll be 65 in just two weeks, that a Black woman has been at the top of the charts. So one of the things I have to call out in this moment is how much this moment reflects on the layers of difficulty, the exponential difficulty being Black and female causes in country spaces and in other spaces. Because I say, in one of my songs, small towns are smaller for girls. And that's a song that's on the album and now recorded by Leila Michaela, but they're even smaller for black girls. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this space that has been so difficult, there's so many black men who've been at the top of the country charts that though I study this, I can't even name them all. I can't remember it uh, because we start with Charlie Pride, but it doesn't end there. There's obviously Darius Rucker and Jimmy Allen, and I'm not going to go into naming others because I don't want to pick out some and leave out others. Mm -hmm. But there's so many you can do that. And still right now there's one black woman, Beyonce. Yeah. 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 That's that's really true. I love in your book, um, when you're talking about that experience of being, you know, being in the room, walk, walking, you know, in the office in music row and um how important, you know, the women who were the women who cleaned and set up the buildings and, you know, kind of anticipated the needs of everyone there, how important they were for helping you in that space. And um, in general, um, your book's attention to like your, your foremothers, you know, in all these different ways and, and for our fathers who, for parents, um, it's just so important and kind of giving people a name and a place um, so that was that was just so powerful. Um, I'm so glad you appreciated that because that was one of the intimate things that was important to me in the book to have people know that the big major ally, one of the biggest allies I had on Music Row was a black woman who was essentially working in a corporate domestic service moment. Yeah. And I said she had waited a long time to see somebody who, who looked like her come into that room and try to have success. And she did so many things to coach me and support me in having success. That's really, that's really wonderful. And I'm glad that she gets to be in your story. Um, and I guess my follow-up to the, to the first question is really like, what do you think um, we need, you know, and this is us as well as everyone out there, like, what do we need to, to keep this moment going? Like, do you think that this is, you know, a, it is a long time, coming um is it a moment that you think we everyday people can sustain i think that i will use my old i know you're from chicago i'm from detroit only time will tell 
right, um, right, right. <laughs> and I think I, a phrase that I don't use that much in the book, but I've used a lot to talk about this, is I think that cultural redlining is real. Yeah. And it's real in many facets of the art world. And um, so I think that we have to dismantle cult, uh, cultural redlining to have this be a sustained moment. And I think about that with three A's. I think we've got an artist, um, archives, and audience. And what I mean by that is I think that one of the things that Black women artists say, Reese Palmer, uh, Miko Marx in 2007 didn't have was financing. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of financing and investment, sometimes on the part of a publishing company, sometimes on the part of a PR company, to break an artist, to make an artist successful in country. And what we find is often Black women don't get that. And mm -hmm. when they do get it, they get it in very strange and exploitive deals and sometimes exploitive managers they are uh, subjected to extraordinary and documented uh, past sexual harassment to sexual abuse, all kinds of things. The money isn't there or it doesn't come remotely for free. So I think that we've got to look at putting in the money for artists and looking at the entire infrastructure that even when you can hire and you have the money, when there's no PR agents, no advertising people that understand your art, look, look like you, reflect you, know what, even what some of... I've had people not know what the links were or not know what the Chicago Defender is they, or doesn't know, they don't know any of the black press or why they might be important or what um, from Blavity. It's just wild what is not known, particularly yeah. if you're in the country music world. Um, so I think we need to make sure that artists are getting the full, the 360 degree support that they need, which starts with good bankers um, it's interesting to me that one, the duo, and I have the same banker. I met them through my banker. And this was a woman, sort of a feminist woman banker doing deals a little bit differently in Nashville. I think that changes things. I think the archives are very important at universities. I think that also goes hand in hand with artists, that one of the things that I talk about this in the book, I did not know Reese Palmer when I encouraged Vanderbilt to buy her papers. Uh, and pay decently good money for them because I felt this was a way of sustaining a working artist. We've now added Miko Marx's papers. There's mm -hmm. a um, worked on that and also Dom Flemons. I'm thinking about it. We might should be getting your papers, Francesca. That and we right here. And I think that and and I really Schlesinger. My papers are at Schlesinger Library. Schlesinger did not pay me for my papers, and I think that this hits artists and black people harder because. We are paid less even in the academy often than our white peers and black artists. Certainly the CMA, the Country Music Association was on a big, interesting meeting. I said, I am not asking any black people to give you artifacts for free. Then they were saying, Willie Nelson did it. George Jones did it. I said, Willie Nelson and George Jones got to make a fortune in country music, millions, tens of millions of dollars. When you ask Willie Weeks and Willie Weeks has given one of his great guitars and as a black man who's played on Vince Gill and the Judds and all these amazing sessions, he also played on Stevie Wonder's Inversions, one of the only people, aside for Stevie Wonder, to play in there. Wow. I don't think it's right to ask this man, who never made a fortune in music, to give his guitar that is objectively valuable and even more valuable because he played it for free to an institution yeah. where it's going to be surrounded by... So I think the archives, if we get our universities to step up and start buying papers and artifacts, it will help sustain the artist, even mid-career and early career in ways that they won't have to beg other people for money. And then we've got to do something about supporting the Black audience. One, the Black audience, it's got to make sure that concerts are comfortable for Black people when they want to come. We've seen now that Black audience exists. They're downloading millions of streams on Spotify. We see it on Instagram. I don't have TikTok, but I certainly see it on Instagram. I've seen people all over the world, black, white, indigenous, and Asian, who are listening not only to Beyonce, but to other country music. Yeah. And putting up, but we've got to make sure when they want to come to live music shows that they're that they are safe. They're not like being always safe on in social media because I've seen some really vicious commentary at times. Absolutely. But, so we've got to make the black audience 
comfortable and safe and invited and welcome because you're making money off of that black audience already. Now it's got to make some kind of cultural experience equity. Yeah, that's that's really wonderful. I love the moment in your book when you're talking about Aretha Franklin's performance finally at the Opry and they paper over that sign of the Daughters of the Revolution, right? The Confederacy, the Confederacy. Confederacy right, right. <laughs> <laughs> key, key important detail there. Um, yeah. And then finally, you know, just thinking about her seeing it, thinking about anyone who is in that gallery performing or attending otherwise. So yeah, that's, that's so true. Linda Martell had to see that so many times. I like, I talk about a first family of black country and that's D4 Bailey, Lil Hardin, Ray Charles as their genius child, Herb Jeffries as little stepchild, the bronze buckaroo and the black film stuff, and then country is cornbread, Charlie Pride, D mm -hmm. child. But I like to remind people, one of the things I figured out working on this book is D4 Bailey, the Opry did not begin in the Ryman. And actually the Opry was only in the Ryman for 20 some years. Mm. And then it moved out to, um, to out by the river into this whole, its own complex. So D4 Bailey didn't see that crazy Confederate gallery sign, but a few times. He was in three different other buildings. But Linda Martell and Charlie Pride were subjected to that every single time they stood on the Ryman stage. Wow. And I think how crazy making, can you imagine Linda Martell? I talk about to be on Plantation Records, and this was not a legacy name. It was a new label founded in the 60s. The man names it Plantation Records and then asked this Black woman, this beautiful, brilliant Black woman with an amazing voice to sing on the Ryman stage, looking out at the words Confederate Gallery and being announced from Plantation Records. It's right. wild that she even survived a year. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah. Deeply steely. And when you hear her on, on Beyonce's album, you know, in her part before Spaghetti, where she's talking about genre, you can tell that she is, you know, a survivor and has like a deep sense of irony and the absurdity of what she's talking about. I really love those sections. I mean, I would have loved also to hear her sing, but I love those sections. I and love those. I love that Linda Martell, one of the things that I love most, and there's so many that I love about Cowboy Carter is that um, I, I write about that. I published my first article about Linda Martell back in 2010. And I'm actually yeah. in that documentary they've made about her. And I yeah. feel that she so deserves note. Um, and I am so thrilled that Beyonce has given her an uh, international global stage. I love though. And you're from Chicago, and my 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 mama of country music though is Lil Hardin Armstrong, who spent most of her life. She was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and she's but she spent most of her life in Chicago. And so, and Ebony Smith, the uh, the well, actually, Ebony Smith, the engineer of our album, is also from Memphis, like Lil. But Lil loves Chicago, and uh, but she would perform in 1930, 1930 on Blue Yodel number nine. And to me, that's what makes her, that was the first million selling country record. Um, back in my Detroit, where I was born in 59, the same year as Motown Records, they used to call it, I put a lot of quotations around this because I don't like language that is not really respectful of the people, but this is just recording what I heard at that time. They're talking about that big Pekka would hit or that big hillbilly hit. Lil knew she had performed on this million selling record. That million selling record was playing in jukebox in Chicago, in Detroit, in 59, when she was having a new hit with Ray Charles's Just for a Thrill. It had been, it's an iconic country single that was being played from 1930 to the present. And there are three geniuses on it. Two of them were black. So I like to point out to people, you know, that the black country, recorded black country story begins in 1927 with D4 Bailey and very importantly is anchored in 1930 with Lil Hardin on Blue Yellow Number no. 9 and then it comes forward with Lil um, uh, Charlie Pride um, Linda Martell being very important people but no one being more important than Ray Charles um, in yeah. modern sounds in country and western yeah 
I love that. Just it's like a th a th a thick description of each of these figures like in the book and you really kind of um, let us know um, so importantly that there is no moment when you know black creativity isn't a part of um, of country music and you start way back you know at the very beginnings of our time you know on working on U.S. soil and then you take us you know right to the to the current moment but uh, there's no way that we can just think of a, a handful of figures by the time we finish your book, which is just really beautiful, um, really great. So, well, um, sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. I say one of my favorite discoveries was one of those early ones. I teach a course on um, African American memoir and biography, and so you know, switches what we're reading every year. But Frederick Douglass's second autobiography ends up having what I think is our first printed example of a country song and fragments of a version of that song mutated appear in the Bob Wills classic, Take Me Back to Tulsa. And I love that I was able to find a country song in 19th century Maryland. That's terrific. That's really amazing. Um, so I was wondering if you, if you don't mind, but like walk us through the process of writing this book because um, you know, this, to me, seems like the book that you were you were born to write, you know. But um, tell us a little bit about um, the first sparks of it, and just the knowledge that you knew you had to write a book, and then um, also like tying in the record, which I think is just a brilliant, brilliant piece of it. Well, I honestly and truly started in some way, and I have some notes for this book that literally go back to 1983. Mm -hmm because I moved here to Nashville in 83 to be a country songwriter, start a country music publishing house. And I thought maybe get an, a doctorate in writing about black people and country music, but nobody was interested in that at all. I read my undergraduate thesis on Jane Austen. There was interest in that. There was no interest in this pivot to uh, country music. So, but I did start collecting material then. I started in, in 2006, I started teaching a course at Vanderbilt called Country Lyric and American Culture. And I, this is not my phrase, I um, gathered this phrase from someone else, learned it, started talking about it as musical miscegenation. But I do think I coined the phrase, I started talking about it as an Afro-Celtic form mm. and teaching it in that way. 2015, in some ways, is the beginning of writing this book in earnest because I started, I, I had a new course called Black Country that was only focused on Black people and country music. And that I used to do the studies for the work that will appear in this book in 2024. But um, in 2019, I think I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I, uh, for a moment, it looked like I didn't have a long time to be going forward. And so I thought if I only had a couple projects, what did I want to do? And the two projects were Finished Black Bottom Saints, which is this wonder, I think, wonderful novel about the Black Detroit world that I grew up in, my first Riverside Music City. And the other thing I wanted to do is finally do this thing I put off all my life, which was write a memoir and tell the story of Black people in country music. So that's, so I've in earnest started doing it as soon as Black Bottom Saints was finished. And Black Bottom Saints was also the genesis of the album because we were putting together, I had a friend to help me, Spotify playlist for all the music of Black Detroit that I talk about 53 artists in that book. It's, it's a bunch of different portraits um, in fiction. Uh, and then the Spotify, someone wanted a playlist of my old music, but I listened to my old music and it just made me so sad and so mad. I didn't enjoy listening to it. I could barely bear to listen to it. I don't, because my heroes and sheroes, my sheroes and heroes have been totally vanished because I imagined them as black people. The cowboys that I was writing about were black and brown cowboys, mm -hmm. and sometimes women. When men were singing them and white men were singing them, the audience was receiving them as white characters. Yeah. The homeless person I was writing about in many mansions, which was recorded by Mobandi was a black woman that I had encountered to come up from the South and get lost in the streets of New York, maybe with addiction, maybe with mental illness, lost in the streets where I've seen life still by winter's bitter chill. When Mobandi sings that, it's an album, title album cut, 
people are only imagining a white man up mm -hmm. south and lost in New York. So that started me thinking, if I'm doing this book, there has to be a new album because I can't bear to hear these songs. And at the same time, so my process of writing the novel, excuse me, the memoir, or as I will confess that I think the original first draft was six or 700 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> was, I had to leave out many people um, of characters because I had worked on this material. As I said, since I've been teaching on it since 2006 and not publishing that much and making studies of it. So one was to write everything I cared about. It wasn't everything I knew, but everything I deeply cared about. Mm -hmm. Everything I deeply cared about, my favorite artist ran to six or 700 pages because I listened to this music, you know, nonstop since 1983 and mm -hmm. I listened to it from my childhood since I was a baby you know little girl so I divided my life very quickly into two sections the first in the 20 from 1983 to about 2000 I was creating country music and from 2000 forward I was spotlighting I was really moving my work towards spotlighting and publishing about the historical people that I didn't want, I was I had given up working in the industry because I was ending up only working with sort of a lot of white superstars, be it Glenn Campbell, Trisha Yearwood, Marie Osmond, to have this success. And I tried to work with black artists and I tried to find black women. I'd gone out and tried to push forward black women artists, tried to consider being an artist myself to do it, but risks um, came up against so many barricades, including we actually recorded, I talk about this in the novel, excuse me, in the memoir, an entire album, the Mother Dixie Sessions, which we have proof of it. So it's definitely a memoir and can't get anywhere with it. And it has the Wooten brothers on it. Three of the Wooten brothers. They have six. One of them has five Grammys. I think one is six Grammys. It had Willie Weeks. It had amazing people. And we get thrown out of every office talking about that South is abusive mother of Black culture, but maybe it's mother nonetheless. Songs like Mother Dixie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it there was not space for the, the album was completed and there was not space for it. So I went on to this idea of spotlighting. So that was one thing to realize what the first half, what the second half was to realize it was three stories that these five specific characters had people had inspired me. D4 Bailey, Lil Harden, Herb Jeffries, Charlie Pride, Ray Charles, and that I wanted to tell their story and particularly Lil Hardin's because it hadn't been told. And so I did additional research to fill that out. I knew so much and learned even more. Um, with um, D. Fort Bailey, one of the exciting things was just to tell the rest of the story I knew that other people didn't mm -hmm. because my uh, first father-in-law had been close to D. Fort Bailey, both personally and um, in business. He was a state senator, a black state senator. And I had the information that D. Fort Bailey had actually written him his first political gene goal and helped him, the first black man to get elected in the state Senate in Tennessee, elected. And so that it wasn't the story that's told in these history books about D. Fort Bailey gets pushed off the Opry and dies in poverty, mm -hmm. finding shoes. I saw that on a national news report recently in this mm -hmm. year's Black History Month. That is not the end of the story. These yeah. the stories, he kept making music and he helped elect a state senator into office. And my personal observation was that uh, Big Avon, as he was called, first cousin of Thurgood Marshall, he had ALS at the end of his life, in the end of his um, Senate terms. And that D. Ford Bailey's example of being not typically able-bodied, but very able, was a shiny example to Big Avon in his fight to hold on his seat in his wheelchair when he couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. So I like to, I love being able to tell that part. I love the part of the oral history. I love the documenting. I like going back into the archives where I did go um, and using internet archives. I think that there was Thorpe, the important collector of cowboy songs who published the first book on cowboy songs. 
He doesn't tell in many places that the first cowboy camp he came upon was a black cowboy camp. But I found an Atlantic Magazine article, which he published right after his death, that he had turned in before he died, which he does confess. And I call it confession because he he strips these cowboys of their race in further in in most general publications. We're not seeing mm-hmm. he does use the N word in that original publication in certain places on certain names, but he doesn't really tell the full story of coming across a black cowboy camp in that well-known text. He mm-hmm. he does in the teens. He does tell it in the 40s. Again, I love spotlighting that information. Yeah. Totally. I like going back and getting the rest of the story. And I'll just note there that part of the reason I knew a little bit more about these black cowboys, and I talk about this, is I was born in Detroit where you know labor was king in 59 Detroit. Black people up from Alabama working on the assembly lines, the breadwinners, I talk about them in Black Bottom Saints. Well, A. Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters were talked about in every nursery school I ever went to, every kindergarten. These were, and many of the sleeping car porters had previously been cowboys and they told those stories. So wow. those stories were in Black Detroit. And then of course, teaching Black African American memoir and autobiography and biography, I come across as an adult, think a scholar and teacher that loves autobiography. But mm-hmm. I had come across it before in my life in my daughter's great grandmother's library. And, but I was hearing those stories in Black Detroit because not only, I mean, and hardly anyone ever puts that together, though Nat Love has pictures of himself in his cowboy work clothes and in his Pullman Porter work clothes in wow. that autobiography. So it should be more commonly known. Yeah, absolutely. That's just um, so powerful and kind of thinking about um, the ways, what you're, you're, what you're kind of revealing to me is the ways that there are these figures who like in a moment like right now with Beyonce, whose stories kind of get told and retold and we get these very bare bone facts about them, um, like DeFord or like Nat Love or even Linda Martell. Um, But there's so much more to the story and you give us this very lush um, way in and also like a very personal and intimate connection to them as well. It's not just about the facts of their lives, which in and of itself is so fascinating, but also that we really see, and it's interwoven how important these songs are to your yourself, to your your journey, your sense of artistry and your healing. And so um, I guess as a big fan of Black Bottom Saints, I, I loved sitting, Googling, and reading while I was reading it. Um, it was wonderful. I think I wrote you a fan letter after I finished because it was just such a joy to read. And reading your memoir, I realized that some of those stories, well, I knew because you kind of say it that those were also historical stories, um, but also the parts about yourself were were in there or about your family. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the process of writing memoir and one that also does talk about hard stories about yourself um you know what that process was like moving from fiction to memoir and um yeah just basically how did what were some of the surprises of that process for you one that's a great question and particularly that we're at karis bookstore i want to give that feminist bookstore really intimate and honest answer i always give an honest answer but an even more intimate answer that um, one of the things you're alluding to, I think, in both of these books, but actually in, I think, all of my novels, um, a one, a girl, a girl is raped. That mm-hmm. happens in the Windangan, mm-hmm. uh, in this plantation slavery circumstance. It happens in Pushkin and the Queen of Spades. Um, actually, in Rebel Yell, it's a boy who's raped by his father. Um, in, so a child is raped in each of these books. Not, I don't know if that is in Ada's Rules, it's a complicated thing in Ada's Rules, but in Black Bottom Saints, Color Girl is abused by her mother, sexually abused by her mother. And um, I think writing about 
I've always said openly that one of the reasons I like country music is it's hard music for people who've gone through hard times. One mm -hmm. of my, so country music has always supported me through these hard times. Music has been something I've had with me the whole way from a, being a little girl. It was a big, I am more explicit emotionally about the details in the fictional story. Mm -hmm. There is more, I think in you know, this, I may say just specifically about the rape in the memoir, he raped me, or it's a very short sentence. And yeah. the detail is all about what the world like looked like to me, mm -hmm. what I saw, what the actual environment looked like to me, how far I felt I was from help, what the geography. I don't talk about any of the details of what was done to me or on me or in me. And that was in the, in the memoir, because I don't believe in, um, frankly, trauma porn. Yeah. In fiction, I felt I, I have talked more about some of the complexities of it with the veil of fiction, because I also thought it was less traumatic to my reader because I was transforming it into beauty. When into some kind of red beauty, there's no beauty in that sentence he raped me or they raped me or it raped me. There's, I wasn't attempting there. There's no, that I can't transform that act into beauty. It's as a real lived experience. It's just horrific. Mm -hmm. I can transform it and talk about the hard one, happy, the end of the, I can talk about, you know, I don't think I even talked much about the family hour song, the song in which, you know, scroll, kills this goes on a hunting accident and such a shame mr johnson died she has a very convenient accident and only two people go out and one person comes home so but that was turning something into that um into beauty into fairy tales in a good way mm -hmm. in the memoir i told the truth as i knew it mm -hmm. and it wasn't all beautiful so yeah. um that and I do feel it's interesting that it it was a risk. Um, I felt very vulnerable afterwards. I've started to tell a little bit more about it. And I feel that anyone with any sense reading it in my novels, because there are certain patterns that are very consistent. Mm -hmm. And most of it's so innovative that there's one thing I keep I come back to and they that um I would I assume that most of my readers realize or thought that I probably had been sexually abused as a child. Um, claiming it, one of the things I love to, about claiming it was when, except for I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which was a really important document to me in my seventh grade life, um, mm -hmm. reading it over and over. I didn't have a lot of literature that told me I would come out on the other side of this and be a happy, wonderful, loving person. And I hope I am a, I am a happy and loving person. I hope I'm wonderful. But I didn't know that that could completely happen. There were times that I thought I'm going to just want to be in my room, in the bathtub, screaming at the top of my lungs when somebody can't hear me, you know, that I'm going to be by the train track so I can scream out loud and no one hears it. Um, so I wanted to write a book before I died, that let somebody know who might be going through some frag, some part, something worse, something frag, like I had gone through, that actually, yes, that you can get to this 100% different place. Mm -hmm. And this was my story and how art and both art I created and art I consumed. Uh, the one of the wonderful things with Old Boy Records is that one of the songs I had in my worst time was a John Prine song. Angel mm -hmm. from Montgomery. It mm -hmm. just found it in this crazy country house um, where some terrible things were happening. And that song, that wish, make me an angel that flies from Montgomery, that promise, make me a picture of an old rodeo. And I'm imagining Herb Jeffries. That reminded me. Or I say that Roberta Flack's first time I ever saw your face is a country song. You have to read the book to understand why I think that. That reminded me of my father's description of the first time he saw my face, which started with the story with him that he wanted my mother to abort me. But when he finally saw my face, he fell in love. And right when, right on time, that song reminded me of love. So I also tell the story in there that's really wild of I come from this country song. 
that my father was this man. You could want him to be some other man. And this is, he was this man that when I would hold my head down, if I was looking sad on when I was a little girl, he was a very good parent. He uh, said, what's wrong, little girl? What's wrong, little girl? And if I didn't say anything, he said, now, you remember, I had that crazy mother. So I had a head held down. He didn't know this. He said, he said, uh, in the morning, it takes a hundred dollars nailed to the dope house, dope house door to get somebody killed. But in the <laughs> afternoon, it only takes when there's a junkie looking for a fix, forty dollars nailed to the dope house door will get anybody killed. What's wrong? I got forty dollars. What's wrong, little girl? Now, the sad part, I'm going to tell you something. That is a country, unrecorded country song that I come from. <laughs> the sad part of that, and this got cut out of my memoir, which I don't know why I let them cut this out of, um, is when my daughter was born, my father sat with me one day, right after, and he said, I've been watching Oprah, and I described it. He was in his black wool pants and black silk shirt, red mohair sweater, looking like what he probably was, an aging, I don't know if he was this, Maybe an aging gangster or not, or man who just owned dry cleaners. I don't know. And he said, I've been watching Oprah. It occurs to me your mother might have abused you. Did your mother abuse you? And I waited and I said, yes. And he said, why didn't you tell me? Hmm. I said, because you would have killed her or had her killed. And he hmm. said, the only thing I would have known how to do. And I said, so I had no one. And we wow. both cried over that. And that may be too hard a truth for the book. And that's why it was cut out. But the first part of it, actually, I wanted to keep in in honesty. I wouldn't let that come out. Because the, one of the reasons I survived abuse the way I did is I knew that justice and mercy was just a phone call away. Yeah. And so I knew the whole time I began to see myself as powerful and heroic because I know I don't believe in the death penalty because I knew that anything that was happening bad to me, if I had called my father and told him, there would have been an end to it. It wasn't the end I wanted, but there would have been an end. Does that make, and so yeah. I love that I had to tell the first part of the story because if not, it wouldn't be the truth of how I got to be who I was. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody doesn't get a daddy is honest. What was wild to me is my father said, that's all that I told him honestly. So I had nobody, but he told me before that it's all I would have known how to do. And mm -hmm. he had to learn that was not enough. So the other thing I say about this memoirs and books and all, the music is so real, mm -hmm. but you gotta have real conversations with real people. Like, I'm glad I'm having a real conversation with you. I'm glad our books can be in conversation because I wanna brag on you for one moment when I got <laughs> the blurb on your book. And I, we can, I feel that it has all, it has nuanced, amazing listenings, reading mm -hmm. of, specific songs and artists that are just extraordinary. But it provides so much theory and integration of theory and scholarship um, into the world of country. It provides a, um, a rubric. It provides a gestalt. It provides a theoretical framework to listen, examine, and to create a scholarship worthy of the art. Hmm. I think mine, does, mine has some theory about country and black country period. But what I have is the lived experience in 41 years of it as the creator of it, reporting on it. And I love the way our books are in conversation with each other. And the artists, we both talk about the Supremes I have over here, but I was, that is me five years old with the crazy, when the Supreme sang at the Copacabana and sang a country song, I remember it, I was ringside. It changed me to hear them sing queen of the house. Mm. I was there. The next day I saw Sammy Davis and Lola Falana. I write about this in the book. And Lola Falana was the only part I liked, dancing <laughs> half naked. And when I would see her 10 years later or a little bit more than that in Lola Colt, the spaghetti Western filmed in Italy, I was in love with it. I'm still in love with it. You can now watch that on YouTube. It's a crazy bad movie, but it meant a lot to me. <laughs> it reminded my daddy who would tell whole Herb Jeffrey movies out loud to me. Like, <laughs> I had a very unusual family. <laughs> I love that. That's that's so terrific. And um, I really appreciate your, your generosity also just in talking about 
my book, but also just being, you know, telling those hard stories and sharing them, going there. Um, so thank you. And um, I, I don't want to end our conversation or at least give up the reins of our conversation before I get a chance to talk about the songs as they work together with the book. Um, and I, you know, you open, I think it's the opening where you're, you're talking about the experience of hearing. Um, Adia Victoria. Yes, Adia Victoria, you know, singing and how it changes the meaning um, of the songs for you by having these wonderful women um, singing and interpreting your music. Um, and if there is one, I know that you can't really choose a favorite because you love all of them, but if there's one where you were really moved by that process of, um, in, in particular, of having um, these knowing, wonderful artists, you know, singing your work, which, which one jumps out at you right now? So many do, but I would have to say one is Rhiannon's Ballad of Sally Ann. Mm -hmm. because she embodied Sally Ann, who is the woman who has her husband lynched between the wedding and the reception. And she embodies resistance mm -hmm. and uh, an insistence on reckoning. Mm -hmm. Whereas when John Cowan, who's considered one of the great singers of new, he was the lead singer of new grass revival, but one of the great 20th century bluegrass singers voices, but he sings it it could almost be one of the white people watching who didn't do anything to stop it. It's yeah. not It's not the white person who dragged the person, but it's one of the people. It's voyeuristic and it's exquisite in its tone and it's a hideous exquisiteness. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't sound pretty when you're singing that mm -hmm. when as a white male voice. Mm -hmm. it, 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 um, when Rihanna sings it, her beauty of her playing and her voice, it is the embodied resistance that we are beautiful despite what has been done to us and on us, that her love for Johnny survives death, that it eclipses the grave. All of that is in that, and that you know means so much to me. But every one of them, I love Reese Palmer and who's minding the garden because it is um the end of some black echo grief begins. And that was done by Glenn Campbell before, who thought mm -hmm. his song was so important. He said, this is as big as Galveston. That was his anti-war song because he wow. knew this was an environmental song. And he knew yeah. this was big. But when Reese, we have been so broken, you've been hung from the trees, it's hard to be one with the land. Wow. When you've been, but Reese finds that. And so many of the artists, Valerie June finds that, that I, find my redemption in a lot of black country in the witness of nature and in the witness of the compensations of familial love and erotic love in these witnesses of black love that rises despite and black hope. These two things are so important to me and I love where they appear in you know, in the album, Big Dream has it so much. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of swagger in my daughter's own new version of X's and O's. And yeah. Sunny War reminds me of some country Nina Simone. You know, like, mm -hmm. how cool could that be? I mean, that is that was a song that I didn't love until I heard Sunny War's version of it. These, so I, I do actually love every single one. And these 11 women who sing on the album, did nothing less than ride to the rescue of my legacy. And mm -hmm. I have to call out the head, well, Ebony Smith, black woman from Memphis, Tennessee, who was the producer. And she gathered this group, this collective. Allison Russell does amazing things with, um, in my father's house are many mansions and many mansions because she turned it to, she rewrote the Bible. I love it. In my mama's, in my mother's house or many, many. Yes. I love that. That's to me, this evidence that this new generation is greater than this generation. I'm happy to be superseded in eclipse for all this young black and brown woman genius. Um, there are many you know, self-defined queer women on this album. I am loving that all of my sisters who came to lift me up 
an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I feel too. That is just so beautiful. Um, okay. It looks like we've got some questions here and I'm going to look at the question tab. Okay. Um, this is from Jody Pritchard. I was thinking about, um, okay. Your beautiful definitions of country and was listening to a podcast of Hozier and Mavis Staples discuss Nina cried power. And it seemed to have so many of the elements you discuss. I'm curious if you've heard it and what your thoughts are, um, are of it. Um, um, and if it meets your take on what country is. You know, I tend to think country is uh, one thing is happening. My computer is about to say it's for some reason is uh -oh. to be not to go out. I didn't drink my, my uh, water. Is, uh, hold on one second. That was a very impromptu thing that we realized. We may have to go without. Oh, wait, wait. Light. Yeah, we're not going to have to go without light. There. Computer now plugged in. Um, my definition of country is the two ones I love to work with are it's. Celtic, English, Irish, Scottish ballot forms, plus African influences, plus evangelical Christianity. I think it needs those three things to be country. I think there are four themes that typically appear in country. Life is hard. God is real. The road, liquor, and family are significant compensations. And the past is better than the present. I think the past is better than the present is often the racial fault line in country that sometimes mm -hmm. in much of country, white country, the past is better than present is a mythologized Dixie or a thirties era earnest sharecropping identity. Whereas in black country, the past that's better than the present is often um, a long for and lost to Africa before a colonization that I think is represented in um, a sense of sacred nature or moments in early childhood where against all odds, a grandparent, aunt, a parent was able to protect a child and give them sort of halcyon moments. You mm. can see that in Reese Palmer Somerville is a great example of it uh, in Rhiannon and the Chocolate Drops Country Girl. So mm. those are the def my working definitions of it because if there's no evangelical Christianity and it has that, the first two elements, you may be having a blues song if there's no black influence in it, you may be in a folk song. It really requires to me all three of these things, but they're never a litmus test, they're a likeliness test. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different ways that African influences can come in. You know, it's read the book, but it's like the Western gospel, the Arizona drains, it, the banjo, the bent note singing that comes out of the field hollers and the blues. There's so many different ways. But if you look on the Beyonce album, Blackbird, all mm -hmm. it took to make it country was adding the black voices that brought in a bit of that black gospel sound that brought in the evangelical Christianity and the black influences. And then yeah. it But it points to, I talk about in my book, the song, Stoney Edwards, 1976 song, Blackbird. And I hope she was also referring to that. If she wasn't, I hope everybody will read this book and know that Stoney Edwards had a wild song in 76 about how black parents protect their children from vicious language. Wow. 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 All right. Checking it out for sure. All right. We have one more question. Um, this is from, sorry, my eyes are bad. Is it Dor Dor maybe Dory? Um, okay. Was there one library archive that you used more than others? where you were where you were able to get in touch with were you able to get in touch with any family members of the older black country artists that were not fully recognized in her stories of the artist yes i was able to like talk to some of d fort bailey's family i was able to you know there's bits and pieces in archives across the country i had to go down to santa fe to see some stuff i've there isn't there is no one place where there is a large representation repository of, on this subject right now. Um, mm -hmm. I think Vanderbilt is actually probably at the forefront of gathering that. Um, a lot of it was oral history and individual things that 
I was finding, but I, and some of it was in tro treasure trolls of black newspapers, like the Michigan Chronicle. I found a whole bunch of um, articles about Herb Jeffries at different times in his career. So um, black newspapers are always a great place to go. Um, and it's so wonderful that so many of them are now digitized. So mm -hmm. you have, um, and then I also use the History Makers Archive, which is life histories of black people that are collected. And they're on, And it was wild to me how many black people do reference having their close encounters with country music. And I noticed that someone is asking about the genre bending. I love that Yola says she's genre fluid. That's why I say it's a likeliness test, not a litmus test. Mm -hmm. But country, and it's beyond the scope of this, has always stood for, in certain parts of our society, as a representative of American. What can be country? There's often a parallel in many people's understanding of who can be American. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the concept is that obviously, I think everybody here can be American, that I is to open up that tent and to not um, be culturally redlined out of it, particularly as Black people contributed so much to the genre. I think ultimately, the part is the thematic part where I hold on to it in my own personal life. Life is hard. God is real. Now, what that God is, is complicated. And mm -hmm. I certainly think in my, that God's a woman too. And I have a, it's, but literally that's one of my lyrics. Um, but I think that life is hard if you just think it and good is real mm -hmm. and that I don't believe in sugarcoating anything, but I believe in getting too hard one happy. And as I said, when I was a child of that little song, the blues, uh, sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long, long way from home. I never understood that song. It caused me cognitive dissonance because I couldn't understand why they were so sad. Because as far as I concerned, the safest thing I could imagine was being a motherless child a long way from home. Because mm -hmm. motherless, if I had only a father, I thought I was going to do better. So my point being, blues didn't work for me as a child because my life was too unhappy for the blues. I needed the joy of my grandmother, she'll be coming around the mountain. Mm -hmm. The absurd, audacious hope that I found in Black country. So That's anyway, beautiful. Charles. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Um, well, you know what? I think this might be a good time to invite you back to talk about buying copies of your book. So I'm going to turn things over now. Okay. Yes. Thank you both so much for this great conversation. Um, just this, these, both of y'all's books are really wonderful for folks who are music fans. Even if you're like, not sure if you're a country music fan, you are, and you just need, you just need to recognize all the places that country shows up in your life. And you're gonna be like, oh yeah, right. Um, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and, and um, this book in particular helps, um, helps you realize all of the ways that country music is just a part of, of American music, of black music, um, and it's it's beautiful. So thank you for being with us. For folks who wanna buy My Black Country, you can click the teal button at the bottom center of the screen and it will take you right there. It'll also take you to buy Francesca's books. Um, so, you know, buy both, have a little book club, compare and contrast. Um, I think there'd be a lot of really great um, things to learn by reading those together. You can also buy one of um, the folks in the chat mentioned this. You can buy the album that goes with this book. Um, I would suggest you buy it directly from Oh Boy Records. Um, I'm assuming that's the best that gets you the most money, right? Um, yeah, but it's also the only way you can get it right now. We are okay because we support the independents. Unless you go to an independent book, uh, independent records record store. Okay, it's so that weird online thing. We're not doing that for a few weeks to support the uh, independent. Good. That's <laughs> great. Good. Well. Uh-oh. Okay. Oh, go to Oh Boy Records and get um, get your copy. Um, you can buy it on CD or vinyl. Um, and you can preview some of the tracks on YouTube, but buy it online um, or in your local record store. I'm sure some of the record stores in Atlanta have it. Thank you to everybody who watched. Oh, Dort's already got it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks to everybody for being with us. And um, until next time, take good care. We really appreciate you.